You're capable of a lot more than you think you are. If I were to look back 10 years ago and you were to tell me that I was buying $2 million apartment complexes through litigation for a million dollars and all, you know, things like this, I wouldn't have believed it. But it just happened a step at a time along the way and one by one it got there. And I'm no brighter or harder working than probably half the people that are watching today. You can turn your life around in five years. There are folks out there that would listen to this right now and say, this sounds so complicated. I don't even know that I could do that. It sounds like it's over my head. Where do I start? You know what I did when I was in that same exact spot six months ago? Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today, we have Logan Fulmer back and Logan Full in from San Antonio to talk about how he buys properties pennies on the dollar. Every dream, right? You go to a seminar event. It's like, yeah, you got to buy pennies on the dollar. But then they just kind of leave you hanging on exactly how to right. do that. Now, I was going through and you were here almost three years ago, right? Uh, June of 2021. So uh, welcome back. Absolutely. Uh, now guys, I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on the show alone is enough to help you become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you will become one. And guys, if you get value out of the show, please hit that subscribe button. That way we can help more people grow. Now, it's been almost three years. What are some of the major changes since you were here last? Man, I hadn't thought about it in that context until you brought it mm -hmm. up. But when I look back over the last three years, I've become less deal oriented and I'm managing a company now. So yes, it's a real estate company. Yes, there's strategy involved, but I'm managing a company. I've got an assistant. I've got an attorney in house. I've got operating partners who I'm helping them grow their businesses. And I'm deciding When's the time to hire more? How do we grow? And it's, it's not deal centric anymore. Mm -hmm. It's a substantial difference. Revenue is wildly different. Of course. Has grown. To be. Yeah. At this point, I've got 20 people in my office. Mm -hmm. um, I had to buy a bigger building. It's, I had to buy a bigger building. Yeah, I mean, didn't you just buy the other one last time you were on the show? Yes. Yeah, that's <laughs> exact. Great memory. Yeah. I love that. There's a, piece in my, a place in my heart for like these old historic mansions, which mm -hmm. is our old office. And after I got rid of that, because we ran out of space, we got a 15,000 square foot building, loaded people in there. We, half of it is tenant space. So we get some income. The other mm -hmm. half we occupy. Gotcha. So lots changed. Deal size, our max deal size back then might have been a million bucks. Mm -hmm. Top, maybe a little more. Mm -hmm. Today I've got a $10 million deal, a $28 million deal, a lot of one, two, $3 million deals. Mm -hmm. Deal size change. Yeah. So you moved away from chasing deals to now you're kind of in this visionary owner's position right? where you have to drive the vision of the company is what it sounds like. That's right. We need to hire nine salespeople in the next five weeks. We launched our done for you sales service just a month ago and the demand for it has been absolutely crazy. We have all these people reaching out to us saying our sales service has been so helpful for them. Please get us more salespeople. If you are in high ticket sales or looking to get into that space, if you want a calendar filled up with people raising their hands saying, call me at this time, please sell me. I want to be sold to by a highly experienced salesperson. We are looking for you to have that role. We want to take people who are good and make them great. People who want to be held accountable the same way Michael Jordan would want his coach to hold him accountable, to take him to that next level. So if you want Ian Ross or myself to train you to get better at sales, if you want to be able to control your income, decide exactly how much money you make, and you want to work at a company where you value and appreciate it, we encourage you, click the link below. However, we're only hiring superstars. If you're not A plus caliber, don't click below. So are you more involved or less involved in your business today? I still spend 50 hours a week mm -hmm. working. I work on different stuff. I'm not at the deal level. I'm not negotiating with people. You know, I'm, I'm talking, I've got operating partners. So there's five different business lines in the office and each one of those is run by a different partner, mm -hmm. different LLCs. They all have a lot of similar strategy, but each guy took ownership and run mm -hmm. the business. So I spend time with them, making sure they're happy, making sure their staffing needs are met. Need, needs are met. Right. How's their revenue? How does their cost look? Do we need new platforms or programs? And interestingly enough, this last year was nothing like what we've experienced in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. At that point, you know, we're holding on to the steering wheel, like powering through, like white knuckling it. 
And thank God we didn't have the experience that a lot of other people did. But right. I mean, it was a test of my leadership for sure. We were yeah. still profitable. We still did really well. Well, we made about half the money of what I wrote in there. We made uh-huh. about half last year than we did the year before. Mm-hmm. Now we picked up incredible equity on deals that we just simply couldn't sell, but they were such great deals. I bought them and we'll be exiting those deals over the next 12 to 24 months. Mm-hmm. And they'll, they will, again, radically change our balance sheet. But, you know, being a manager of since during those times is, is a test, man. I'm glad I had seven or eight years of practice. Yeah. So you said there were a couple of things that tested your leadership. <laughs> what were those things that tested your leadership? Historically, cash goes out, cash comes in. At a really, more cash is coming in that's going out because that means you're growing. Yeah. And you're reinvesting. It went the other way around. Cash mm-hmm. was going out. So let me back up. We all read about this, say when markets go down, all these people get rich, right? Mm -hmm. Because they get all these good deals. That's great. But Mm -hmm. your revenue is going to suffer. I don't care how good you are. Mm -hmm. Even the best companies, it's going to suffer. Absolutely. So you're taking advantage of these incredible deals, buying this ridiculous warehouse at a 20 cap. Like that's unheard of. You're killing it. Mm -hmm. And then you get halfway through the year and you're like, oh my gosh, all that cash that we've built and the credit we've began to build over the years, it's dwindling so quickly. That if we continue at the same rate by the end of the year, we'd be out of cash. Uh-huh. What are we going to do? Yeah. So now I got to step back and say, all right, guys, first I'll slow down. And they're like, I got to go find the new deal. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Calm down. Let's figure this out. Yeah. We're having, we had to decide to take on, on a really large deal. We took on partners. So other equity outside of ours, which is new to us. Uh-huh. Um, between that, we really had to stay disciplined and say, I know this deal is a 70% on the dollar deal. And we would do those systematically in the past when the market would absorb things like this. Yeah. When you bring this offering to the market in the last year, it doesn't absorb it the way it did. Right. No more of that, guys. 50%, 30% deals. We have to stay ultra disciplined. Mm-hmm. And we walked from some great deals, but we had to take the best so that we could use our capital judiciously. Mm-hmm. And we also had to work really hard at cycling it quicker. We would just dump stuff on the market. And someone <laughs> would just, it would magically vanish and money right. would come back. Yeah. Mm-mm. Your listings have to be good. We're taking calls like as a sales operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have to prep. You have to get all the diligent stocks ready for people. Like it's no joke. And you're going to price it right. And then you're going to price it a little less than that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it won't sell like this. Yeah. The, the dispo process definitely changed, right? Yeah. For us, we use mostly MLS and this mm -hmm. stuff because we own, but still you need to have it together. You need to answer the calls. You need to get back to him. Like there's no horsing around. Yeah. I think, uh, the, when the tides shifted, right, or winds changed from 22, what we saw was like all these end buyers who were being treated abusively by all of us on the wholesale side were happy to have their turn to turn it back on us, right? And so if you weren't on point, they got to be disrespectful. They got to be rude. They got to treat you like, ah, well, it's me or one other buyer maybe, and that's it. Right. Who do you want to work with? And a lot of the folks that you didn't that didn't do well or, or didn't have any business doing this business, but they rounded up some people, got some cheap credit, and they were doing deals and they shouldn't have. Those people are gone. So the ones oh, yeah. that were left were the solid, sophisticated mm-hmm. ones that were disciplined. Mm-hmm. And you better treat them right right now. Otherwise, there's 40 <laughs> of us out there. Yeah. They'll move from you to somebody else. Like that. So you had to uh, be judicious in the deals that you bought. Now, one potential challenge I'm thinking about, if you have to be more judicious, because we saw this, is you've got guys bringing you deals that are great deals. They're out there, they're hunting for you. And because you're saying no, that means they're not getting a commission. The team shrunk. Yeah, so how, 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 were the, how did that play out in your, in your business? It's tough, because as an owner, I'm making decisions to protect capital and mm-hmm and protect the going concern of a company. A sales guy who's trying to keep making his 10 or $20,000 a month is like, buy the deal, buy the deal, it's good. And, I, and he will not ever understand what I'm trying to explain to him until he sees a couple of deals not go the way he anticipated. And that's mm-hmm. the way I learned. Some of those weren't working like we thought. And the guy's like, dude, these are good deals. <laughs> They're not, not, not in today's world. Mm-hmm. So it's tough, but our sales team shrunk substantially. We have in our wholesaling business line, at that time we had, 14 people on that side of the office. Today it's four. And we're doing only much fewer really good deals Mm -hmm. that if they don't sell, we should probably just buy them anyway and it's okay. Mm -hmm. So that substantially shrunk volume, churn, and overhead. Yeah. 
So sleeping better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned you got an in-house attorney. Yeah. Only one? I have one, and we have another one we're getting ready to bring on. We're interviewing right now. Remind me again, were you also uh, an attorney? I'm not, no. You're not. Okay, so you always did this uh, on the, you always had an in-house attorney that was doing all this. So I had a guy that was, yeah, he was spending about half of his time on us. Mm -hmm. And within the first year and a half, we said, we need you all the way. Mm -hmm. So we have that. He's the same guy he's been with me. Then I started using three or four other attorneys for side work because while this one attorney has enough bandwidth to do all of our work, when you have to do three at the same time, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So now we, sit, we have several that are outside, probably spending 10 to 25% of their total billable hours to us. And while it's interesting, it's neat because you have, you can get a lot done in a short amount of time, you lose some control. Mm -hmm. And I want to walk next door in my office and just say, make this call, type this petition, get this response out. You can't do that when someone works for a firm. Yeah. We used to have just up the hall, our title company. Oh my gosh. Right? So convenient. So we could just walk over there and just hand them a check for earnest money. And, <laughs> That's if, gold. They, and if they weren't returning our calls, we could just walk over there and I was like, hey, what's going on with this? We don't have that at this moment. They moved to a different building. So, uh, but the other thing too, uh, with an in-house attorney is we've thought about bringing it on because we were, we were in a situation where like, it wasn't the right time to bring, house in, bring in in-house counsel, but it felt like we were getting there. Like whether it was this lawsuit or this complaint, or we need to issue uh um what's it called to to, to demand get, letters to get someone to sell um listing agreement notices uh, no the to to force them to sell what is it called oh uh, partition oh the partition sells if, if there's multiple owners but the yeah. specific performance oh yeah right yeah. so like there are all these things like man it'd be much easier because like we're either walking away from deals or just like not fighting it because like is it worth it right if you got if you have an in-house attorney everything's worth it Right? Just send it. We'll see where it goes. So when you look at what it's going to cost you between two fifty and four hundred dollars an hour for an outside firm, mm -hmm. dude, that's between five hundred and eight hundred thousand a year if it's full time. Right. To bring somebody in house, you can get a stud for two hundred, two hundred and fifty grand. Yeah. So everything is worth it. You're, yeah. you're already paying him. That's right. Send him a nice a letter on your letterhead and uh -huh. let's go. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So something that I've found as we were growing through this, we went through a process of with a friend of ours, we almost hired a guy mm -hmm. and then he took half the time and we took half the time. That mm -hmm. was going to be the interim step. And then we hit a growth spurt and we said, forget it. We'll just do it. Yeah. Uh, and I think I saw on your, by the way, your Facebook engagement is exceptionally high. Every time I see you post something, you get a bunch of reactions and a bunch of comments, right? Thanks. And I think I saw something a day or two ago about like, oh, another lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> I think you recorded the video. Oh, the of process you, server. You were walking up to meet the process server. Yeah, they're always like, hey, it's, low. it's like me or one of the partners are getting notice of something. Yeah. And it's like, literally, when someone comes to the office, I think we have more process servers than appointments now. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to me about like what, what is going on to have, that, to have that much activity from process servers inside your office. You know, we get involved in a lot of pro properties that have judgments or liens. Um, outstanding um, tax. So in Texas, we're a judicial foreclosure state for mm -hmm. taxes. So basically the way most people understand it is there's going to be a tax sale every Tuesday and people don't pay their property taxes or property's getting sold. Well, when you get really deep into that, start to get really sophisticated, you can enjoin yourself in those tax lawsuits when you buy shares of the property. And now- You said enjoin? Yeah. So I'm going to intervene. So mm -hmm. for example, if you and your sibling both owned a property 50-50 and y'all couldn't agree and the tax sale is about to happen, you want to sell, they don't, you could sell me your share. Mm -hmm. Without title insurance, I buy your share. Now I go to the other sibling and say, look, I picked up some equity on Steve's share. Let's go sell together. You could sell your share to me. But we have two weeks until this tax sale. So we need to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And if they're still unreasonable, I can file something to stop the tax foreclosure mm -hmm. and be added as an intervener. So I can enjoin myself into the lawsuit. Mm -hmm. The reason you want that is because before I'm in that lawsuit listed as a defendant, I can't get the excess proceeds. Right. And you can't assign your rights to me in Texas for me to go get your excess proceeds. Mm -hmm. I need to be in the lawsuit. Yeah. But once I do that, now I go back to your sibling and say, house property's getting sold by the sheriff and I'm just going to watch it. 
and mm-hmm. I'll get the excess proceeds. But if you'll play ball with me, we'll go to the market and get the top dollar instead of letting it auction off. All right. So it's a defense mechanism. Splitting the excess proceeds or you're getting the excess proceeds? Depends on who responds to the, to the petition. Gotcha. So you're putting yourself in a really good position here. Right. And he, he has to play ball. They do. They should. They should. One at about 15, go that route. The rest mm-hmm. of them, I negotiate. Like sometimes I'll say, look, you're in a tough spot. I know you don't have the money to pay the taxes. I know you need to live here a little bit longer. Let me restrain the county. And when we go sell together, I want a third of your share or I want a half of your share, your proceeds, but I'm going to pay the taxes. I'm going to deal with any judgments or liens, and I'm going to prevent the county from selling it out from under you on Tuesday. But I want a share of your share. Mm-hmm. So let's do that, and I'll let you live there for the next 90 days, figure it out, I'll help you find a place. Right. But I get share your share. Is that where a majority of your business is coming from? You know, delinquent. So I have found there's a million ways to look at these types of deals and find them, search them out everywhere. Mm-hmm. But the most common thread I found over the years is every one of them is behind on taxes. Right. Almost. So we started shopping with a delinquent tax list. And A, we have good deals for delinquent tax list. B, half of them have title problems. Right. So I think every single one of them that we're dealing with these days have a delinquent tax component. Yeah. I mean, that's the one area where I am extremely envious. Well, y'all have low property taxes out here. Yeah. Right. I'm extremely envious of how things are done because you guys in Texas don't mess around. Right. Super Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> right. Super Tuesday. Yeah. And let's, just, let's go to work. And it's just the way it's done. And there's a lot of people that do a lot of business from tax sales. Um, but between the higher taxes, so it adds up pretty quick. Oh, yeah. Um, and the fact that you guys don't mess around with those foreclosures. Because yeah. we have, I think you get two years you can be behind on taxes before you can lose it. I think the third year is when you actually lose the home. Oh, wow. In Texas, you can be served as soon as the first year during your delinquency. Mm -hmm. It's quick. Right. But some of them can drag on for 10 years because we have a pretty detailed process. Everyone's got to be noticed. You have to identify all the owners, and many times there are multiple owners because they've inherited it, so Mm -hmm. it's a slower process sometimes. Yeah, and I've seen other ones where my understanding is if they're elderly, it's a whole different scenario so there are times where if an elderly person files for a deferral then the county will not foreclose and they basically just have an agreement that says we're gonna let the taxes run and when you die we're selling this like right after you die Mm -hmm. and we're gonna get all of our money you would not believe the statutory interest rate is almost 40 it's 38 percent so they're getting all of it they are killing it there is no leftover yeah their payment is deferred but the office the tax office is getting every nickel that equity yeah gotcha it's a hell of an investment. I wish I could buy those investments. Well, you just got to start your own government. Uh, <laughs> so then you say you got partners you work with. So you were saying you got multiple, what was it operational partners? What was it? Yeah. The, so I would say an operating partner is the right way to call mm-hmm. it. They were guys that had been in real estate or were just starting and they had the talent, they had the drive, but they didn't have the experience or the capitalization that I mm-hmm. had. So we'd meet and say, look, let's work together for about a year and I'll teach you everything I think I know. Mm-hmm. And I'll capitalize this thing and you run the business. You go find the deals, let's figure them out, let's sell them. If you want to hire employees in your company to grow it, you can do that. And that's allowed me to grow and retain really good people. Mm -hmm. Whereas most folks, you get a superstar who's so good and he's entrepreneurial. A couple of years, dude, he's gone. Right. Well, I say, whoa, whoa, don't leave. Let's just be a partner. Yeah. And he's going to go out and try to find someone to help him raise money Mm -hmm. and try to, most deal guys are deals guys, deal guys. They don't want to hire a secretary. They don't want to deal with banking. They don't want to deal with paperwork. Mm -hmm. I'll do all that. Just go find the deals. Yeah. Okay. So an operating partner, these are not all partners together. No. It's you have multiple partnerships. Several business lines. Yeah. There's more or less half a dozen business lines in mm-hmm. that office and each one has its own owner operator. Yeah. So it's interesting because I was going through your bio. You call these business lines, right? So I hear yeah. business line. I'm thinking like a business line of credit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right? So you're saying business line. So uh, for everyone that's listening, right, that might want to go down this direction. Right. What does it mean to have multiple business lines? You know, I guess that's the right word that I use, but it's basically like owning six businesses. Mm -hmm. The difference is I'm not the sole operator of each one. I found a really special person and they run that business. Right. So their role would be president, CEO, and owner. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when a business gets big, you'll hire those roles. Mm -hmm. In this case, they got half the equity and I can depend on having them as a partner or a manager far longer than you could a hired hand like a Mm -hmm. president or CEO. 
Um, how many of those do you have? Five. Five. I think I met Kyle last time. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, um, so five capital partners. Mm-hmm. How did you find these cap or these operating partners? You know, it's it's a lot like getting married, actually. Like, like having a, five wives, dude. Yeah, <laughs> like in the straightest <laughs> way possible. <laughs> You've got to find someone who you get along with. Mm-hmm. You've got to find someone that shares the same core values in terms of willingness to work, dedication, intellect. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's actually a really interesting thing because a lot of folks' partnerships don't work out. Right. But I met one guy, Ryan. He was my first partner there. And I worked with him for a year and just watched how he manages personal money. I watched his relationship with his wife. There's mm-hmm. a lot working next to someone day to day you can see. Mm-hmm. I watched how he managed his nutrition. I mean, all these little things, I'm like, what kind of dude is this? Mm-hmm. And after the year, I said, dude, I can be a partner with you. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. And after that experience, probably about six months later, I said, you know, I want to do this again. Mm-hmm. And you would be surprised if you walk around every day, all day thinking, would you be a good partner? Would you be a good partner? Would you be a good partner? You'd be surprised. You have good partners in your sphere right now. Mm-hmm. You just haven't looked at them through that lens. Gotcha. So now going back, it makes more sense when you're saying tested your leadership because you get five or six partners yeah and you have to have this conversation with every single one yep and ultimately you go through a there's these things where this happens with every human they want this job so bad they can't see straight they get the job they start getting raises three years in the job's not as important as it once was and then they think well your business can't run without me mm-hmm. or you know there's all these internal struggles that they have and i find in the life of a partnership i've seen that too you know, the guys just want to be the partner so bad they can't see straight. Well, when these guys have two million bucks in their bank account and all these rent properties, you know, they start to think, well, should I have all the pie? And mm-hmm. that's a challenge too for leadership. So I've got to sit down and say, let's talk about this. This has to be a direct conversation. I like you. I care about you. Oh, but you see me going doing a bunch of speaking and not participating in your business and you're doing the work. Remember, mm-hmm. you're the operating partner. We talked through that and I say, well, let's talk about it. If we broke up the company next week, what would you do? And they tell me they'd go run an office. They'd go hire a secretary. They'd go do all this stuff. I'm like, wait a second. All that takes like four months, but you're not doing any deals. And then we start to talk about what it really looks like. And a lot of times they realize, man, what we have here is pretty good. Mm-hmm. I don't know that I want to be the dude that fools with that stuff. Right. But it, those things happen. Yeah. Have you had, to, uh, had any, after that conversation, decide to go off to do their, own, do their own thing? No. One guy, he, we started, he initiated that conversation. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of on the fence, you know, for the first year, he was a killer. And the last year he was like, I was just, I don't know what happened to the guy. Mm-hmm. And finally, when he brought the conversation up, I said, you know what? This is a good time. Let's talk. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't what he expected. It was the other way around. Like this was down to mind it up, sell the assets and go. Yeah. It was the right move for us both. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, was, I didn't expect it. Right. Um, so again, multiple business lines. Yeah. What is the forte for each one of these guys? One of the guys does mortgage for pre-mortgage foreclosures only mm-hmm. marketing to trustee sale postings three weeks before the mortgage foreclosure. Another guy does commercial wholesaling. Another guy does uh, tax delinquent tax foreclosures. And then another guy does kind of a combination of those. Mm-hmm. But ultimately they're all looking through a lens of distress and trying to find opportunity through that lens of distress. Right. It's kind of just different channels. Mm-hmm because they've each gotten really good at a specific one. And instead of trying to be, you know, a jack of all these trades, they say, I'm just going to tone this or hone it into this one. Yeah. So it's very systematic. It's very articulate. I mean, it's mapped out like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, what this process looks like. Mm -hmm. And it literally, you put in the input and it literally spits out discount properties on the other end. Yeah. And this is a very custom business. So over 10 years, the fact that we've been able to get it producing in a way like this is, I feel very proud of it. Oh, absolutely. And I think having multiple operating, operating partners who have their own strengths and are hunting their own thing. So they get to be great at what they're great at versus you trying to be great at three, four or five different things. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I can conceptualize those things and help people get there, but doing that stuff, doing the work actually is, it's a different thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I think, you know, tax, we just talk, talked about that a moment ago. Pre-foreclosures, I mean, a lot of people do pre-foreclosures. Is there anything exceptional that your guy does that we should talk about here? 
You know, in that case, the guys that are doing pre-foreclosures, I'll tell you where they destroy everybody. Mm -hmm. There is no delay. The posting comes out in the land records that says there's going to be a foreclosure sale in 21 days, usually, or at least 21 days. Folks will buy a list of those, and that list is produced a week or so after that data is out there, and the list isn't updated as often. We're checking the land records at 9 a.m. in the morning for the postings that have happened from noon until 5 yesterday. Uh Literally, the first person to see these will pull those listings, will vet equity, make sure it hasn't been resold or sold already or deed changed hands. We'll dump it into our data program. We'll pull the data out. And by 11 o'clock, we're calling those people. Mm -hmm. So within 24 hours of the substitute trustee filing, we are calling them and setting appointment or cutting a deal on the phone. We are the first one, first pig to the trough, withstanding nothing. Uh, Is that public record? Yeah. So That's the thing. You can. I literally (laughs) talk about this all the time. I'm still the first pig to the trough, man. Yeah. It's it's fascinating because the data is there. It's just not organized where you can just hit the export button yeah that's true you have to look at a legal filing and pull four or five pieces of data dump it into crm and do a little work and it's great because that's just that little bit of difference between you doing it and then going to for example a prop stream i don't know propelio is still doing it they don't pull the data like this though i know they all say Mm -hmm. but i'll tell you what if i could buy those programs for a hundred dollars a month and they get the data that i need this quickly believe me i'd do it oh of course of course there's going to be a delay Right. And that's the that's the thing. I mean, like uh, I, I, I've done a lot of work with investor machine. They have VAs just scraping websites. Wow. So the VAs are scraping websites and you're getting the data. And so what, what we found a lot was like, I would talk to you. And I'm like the first person to talk to you. And like, we'll see where this goes. But like, no, they're still really hopeful. Right. Because in Arizona, you got another three months. You have 21 days. Oh, my gosh. Y'all's are like 90 days. We have 90 days. So they're like, super, they're still super hopeful. I can figure this out. Right. And like, it's irritating. And then when we do our follow-up call, you know, a couple of weeks later, now everyone that's got prop stream has hit them up, right? So, like, we get data fast, but if we don't close them, lock them up in those first two weeks. Get ready for the calls. Then everyone else is getting them. And it sounds like you kind of have the same thing, but right. fortunately for you guys, you get 21 days. So, there is not, like, well, I'm going to work it out with the banks. Like, no, you're... <laughs> obstacle i hear from newer wholesalers is finding buyers for their deals because unless you've built a massive buyers list or have a huge dispo team you might struggle to move your deals so when we started working with InvestorLive, we've been able to reach new buyers and sell deals faster at higher prices we can see buyers in our area their contact information and with the new ai capabilities connect with the buyers most interested in our deals based on the algorithms we can also see who's clicked on our deals, how many pictures they clicked on, and how long they spent looking at it, and finally, what actions they took after engaging with our deals. We are now connected with thousands of buyers in our markets, and we now know exactly where we are with each deal and what next steps to take. If this sounds like something that would resolve or help your dispo process, I highly encourage you, go to the website, put in disruptors for 10% off, so you can focus on locking up deals unless I'm worried, stressed, and frustrated about finding buyers. You, you've already, that should have happened. So there's that. That's one of the most important parts. The second part is everybody is hitting people with low ball offers. And obviously we do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But we have another offer where we'll say, look, why don't we do this? Let's get the foreclosure postponed. If we need to pay a reinstatement or a fee or whatever, maybe we need to file, file a restraining order with our attorney against your lender to protect you. We'll then get my wife to list your property for anywhere between 10 and a 20% commission. Mm-hmm. So traditional is six, but it's not, it's not fixed. Mm-hmm. It's, it's traditional. All right. So when we do the listing, let's say we do a 15% listing, mm-hmm. 3% to the buyer's agent, 12% mm-hmm. to the listing agent, mm-hmm. a $300,000 house, you're talking 30 to 40 grand. Right. That's a great wholesale fee. It is. So if the folks just don't want to quite let go or aren't quite ready, I can destroy all the other investor offers by saying, let us take you to market. Mm-hmm. You'll likely net more with us and we're going to do great. And now they're on board with this because there's no one that can offer higher than us. Right. So it's another way we're really elbowing other people out of the way. <laughs> it's destroying the competition. Yeah. I love it. Um, so uh, this might be a ridiculous question, but then cash buyers were really your only option, right? Uh, at a 15% commission. Well, no. So in this case, we're going to MLS. Mm-hmm. Right. No, I get that part. And folks, will, as long as the house is in good enough condition, they're selling to... Conventional lending, sometimes FHA, VA. Because I've 
tried that. And I got my hands slapped pretty hard. What do you mean? From a broker? Uh, from the lo lenders, right? There are, I think they were saying 8% was the maximum commission. Really? We could collect on a, on, on a finance deal. So it was cash. It was like whatever, right? You Where was that? Me. Was that in Arizona? That was in Arizona. So you can collect wow. whatever commission you want on a cash transaction. But on a finance transaction where it's government backed, I got a lot of pushback. They're like, Interesting. If it was more than eight, then they're starting to ask what's wrong with the Why? broker. Why? Yeah. We haven't had that problem. We've okay. seen conventional loans. We've See, seen I'm loving FHA. Texas more and more. So I might be moving. <laughs> <laughs> I might be joining you in Texas. We have good, our rules and regs are good. Yeah. They really are. You can't horse around, can't break the law. But I'll tell you, man, we've got a lot of leniency to play. Now, mm -hmm. You know, at the end of the day, that with this kind of, we have a lot of bad actors because we've got lax rules. There's a lot of room in there. But I'll tell you what, we're up front, up front and we're honest with people. Mm. And we tell people, look, we're going to make good money doing this much more than a traditional realer. However, we're going to get you more than everybody else. We're going to engage our attorney to make sure that there's no loss here. And we're going to deliver you to market. So just chill out. And we'll get you paid in a month or two. Mm. Yeah. And I believe it's a great service to them, especially considering the alternatives. Oh, yeah. It's the best option for them. Right, right. As long as the best option for them, you go get a six percent realtor. That means you got your shit together four months ago. You didn't do that. Now we're here. Now we're here. Right. So you want more money or not? Right. It's a pretty pretty easy sales pitch. Yep. Uh, now you mentioned substitution of trustee. Uh huh. So you want to elaborate for those that are less sophisticated as far as reading filed documents, what that means. So the substitution of trustee or the notice of sale, sometimes mm -hmm. they can be combined. When a mortgage is originated, a trustee is listed for the lender. And that's basically like a custodian. Like mm -hmm. if something goes wrong with that loan, a borrower doesn't pay or they have problems with it, that trustee is supposed to figure out how to fix it. He's right. the lawyer that represents the lender. Right. When it comes time to do a foreclosure, a lot of times there are big groups of law firms that are listed as trustees. So substitute trustee filing means... That old substitute, that old trustee lawyer, we're appointing a new one. Mm -hmm. And if you see that just filed, that means a foreclosure is coming because you have no need to appoint a new trustee. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll see the substitute trustee notice filed and there's no notice of sale yet. That's a little earlier indicator that a, mor a mortgage foreclosure is coming. Right. It's a one-page document. It says it real big. Substitute trustee notice. Yeah. This is as good as a foreclosure filing. Get on the phone, call them. Yeah. So I think that's for anyone that's listening right now that... Yeah. They didn't know that bit. That is a huge takeaway, right? Like, not everyone knows that. Because so everyone knows, like, 30-day late, notice trustee sale, and this and that, which are important, right? Because that is the formal notice. Right. Logan, I'm foreclosing on you. But not everyone knows is the substitution of trustee is, hey, we're about to foreclose on you, and we're just getting our ducks in a row. Bingo. Yeah. That's it. So I, that was a big tidbit for everyone that's, that may not be familiar with it. Check your public records for substitution of trustees. Uh, so the commercial, that was when we talked about last time. So people may not have heard the last one. Commercial is always an interesting situation for wholesaling, right? Yeah. There's not a lot of people do it. I, you're for me, I think the only person that comes to mind yeah. for commercial wholesaling. So I don't talk know a lot me. of folks that do it. Yeah. So talk to me about uh, commercial wholesaling. Every once in a while, you'll see folks sell off a contract because these are sophisticated people generally in the commercial world versus the single family world. Mm -hmm. So you might have a buyer, he's an investor, or maybe even an end user contracts a property and decides it's not for him. Something during his diligence period lets him decide that's just not right for me or I, it doesn't work. They can sell that contract and brokers are, there's a big network. Brokers talk much more in commercial than they do residential. They're all like intertwined. Mm -hmm. And they can sell off that contract. And you do see it happen in the commercial world, not as a wholesaler. It's just sophisticated buyers and sellers do this. Right. They, they intermingle. Yeah. They, they, they're not bound by the code of ethics. It's different. Yeah. You know, I've seen, I've read about transactions in Manhattan, like the Coca-Cola building several years ago was like a eight or $900 million transaction, if I recall, on Fifth Avenue, I think. The buyers contracted it and couldn't get lending arranged. So they filed a lawsuit against the seller. <laughs> Coca-Cola to slow them down from ending the contract. They went and found another person that was credit worthy and sold them the contract for like $50 million or something. That's the largest assigned <laughs> commercial deal that I've heard of, Yeah, but it happens. Yeah. And I remember watching some old video, I think it was like an Instagram or whatever of like Donald Trump. Right? Oh, really? Wholesaling uh, uh, a, a commercial building that he had. Right. Except 
he didn't call it wholesaling. He was yeah. assigning his option Bingo. on the contract. That's it. Yeah. So, going so, back to, so there's that situation where it just yeah. happens. So the reason I say that is to set the tone because it just happens more in that world than it does single family. Yeah. In this case, we said we've done this with single family and duplexes and fourplexes. Why don't we do this with commercial but intentionally? Mm-hmm. Well, let's go get contracts. We're really good at valuing and understanding the market value in these the big MSAs in Texas. Let's go get contracts for property that's less than it's worth or close. See if we can sell them. And why it's a little, it's got some opportunities in commercial because values fluctuate so easily in commercial. The way that happens is most people are looking at it on the income model. That's like, you know, your golden rule, but an owner user might pay a little bit more. So you have a different valuation for the owner user. It's rent versus what's my mortgage. That's a different way to look at it. Outside of that, you might have different people that say, you know what, that's not the prime market, but that's a great market for me. Like mm-hmm. that location in town is not the best location that there is in town, but for me, it's great. Right. So values can fluctuate on that. So the reason I say that is values are not kind of dead on as you would think. Mm-hmm. Like a house, go to Zillow, it's in a subdivision. Dude, the numbers here, it's pretty close, but it's fixed yeah. up. Not right. like that with buildings. A seller can sell me a warehouse or contract to sell me a warehouse for a million and a half, and it's worth two million because I know the buyers that want that really bad over there. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't necessarily know that difference. And his broker, unless they're an expert in that particular industrial market in that niche, he doesn't know either. Right. So there's a lot of room to find the differences there Mm -hmm. in the commercial space. So just to reiterate, you got a property that might be valued a certain way based off of cap rates. Yeah. Right. Based off of net operating income. And that's that's just how they value for this area, for this property type, this is the cap rate. And then you find an end buyer who is willing to pay a premium because all he cares about is what does it cost for me to get into this building, leasing it versus buying it. Right. That landscape company is going to pay rent over here. And if he's got the money for a down payment, his mortgage is actually less. He would rather do that. So he's willing to pay a little bit more money than the Mm -hmm. disciplined investor who's looking for a nine cap. Right. So there's a lot of that. If I had to guess, half of our stuff sells to an investor. The other half does sell to an end user because there's that premium associated mm-hmm. with them. So are you paying close to market? Or are you paying slightly discounted? What are you paying for, uh, for, the property, for the commercial properties you're wholesaling? I'm looking to get about 10% discount. And the yeah. interesting part is you're looking at much bigger dollars. So 10% on single family, that's eh, nice, but it's not life-changing. Mm-hmm. 10% on a million dollars is 100 grand. Mm -hmm. 10% on $4 million is damn near half a million dollars. Right. That matters. The other part is a lot of these broke. Now, sometimes you get a better deal or you get a much bigger discount. Mm -hmm. But another component of this that's really important is brokers aren't really there to fight you on the nickels and dimes. They're there to get a deal done. Mm -hmm. In residential, if someone's getting ready to sell you their house for 270, it's worth 300. And they call a realtor, dude, realtors coming in here hot. They're bombing your deal, dude. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Their job is to get the top dollar for their client. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in commercial. Think about if uh, if uh, someone's gonna a, a seller is ready to sell me a warehouse for two million bucks, mm-hmm. but or I'm sorry if they're gonna sell it to me for one point five, but it's worth two. Okay, they engage a broker. He starts helping them. The difference between the commission on one point five and two for the buy side broker is what was that forty thousand or sixty thousand? I mean, it's typically two percent. I think three on this price point is three. So okay. Three six or forty five thousand mm-hmm. would be three percent on one point five million. Yeah, forty five thousand or sixty thousand. Right, a fifteen k difference. Right. At the end of the day, most commercial stuff takes six months or a year or more. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're a broker and something sh- somebody shows up and says, "I'm ready to do the deal now," they got proof of funds, we got a buyer seller ready, and am I going to go and say, "No, no, no, I don't want that deal. It make forty five. I want to fight." my whole life and the market and the buyers and sellers and all that to make 15,000 more in 24 months. Hell no. They want 45 right now. Let's get the deal done. And the buyers brokers are generally our best advocates. Mm -hmm. Whereas in residential, it's typically. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a a lot of the commercial brokers have massive drinking problems because (laughs) they have the, it's not like there's abundance of deals. It's tough. They might work a year and a half on one deal. And it's still 50-50. It's going to close on closing day. That's elephant hunting, man. Yeah. Feast or famine, dude. Right. So, yeah, that guy is definitely not going to be fighting you over $15,000. Bingo. Yeah. So, also, when you're dealing with single family and someone says, I'm going to call my attorney and get some guidance, 
you know, that you, you immediately think that's going to be trouble. Mm. In this case, they just need the attorney to look over the contract. That attorney doesn't give a fuck about the price. <laughs> they don't spend time dealing with that. Well, they can't, they're not even qualified. That's all well, right. Yeah. Yep. So, so right now, um, you're buying, we we're talking about the show, right? How to buy properties, pennies on the dollar. So what advice are we giving to our listeners on how to buy properties for pennies on the dollar? So these are all really interesting, like, I guess, subcomponents of a mm-hmm. of, of more foundational message is distressed property acquisition is where all of this is starting for me. I don't like to do construction. There's all these things that I'm not willing to do, but if I can buy your monster energy drink that is worth three bucks, mm-hmm. if I can buy that for a dollar, a dollar fifty, how many can I load up on? Because right. I don't have to do any work. I can just liquidate it for two seventy five and make money, or I can go to a retail market and get three bucks. I make a lot of money mm-hmm. without doing any additional construction or any other work. So, you've got tens of thousands of properties in almost every big city that have extreme ownership issues, title problems, tax liens, breaks in the title chain, you name it. Every single person looking at this show right now has countless deals in their CRM that could not close and they walked away from. Those are the deals I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Not the deals that you're actively working, the deals that you couldn't close. Those are the deals that we examine and say, can we make something out of this? So just to clarify, the deals that we couldn't close because of title issues. Right. Right. Not Not because of like a knucklehead seller who wants too much money. Not that. Or a realtor getting in the way. Right. Or a realtor getting in the way. (laughs) Right. Actual title issues. Right. We're looking at Let's say grandpa owned the property and four or five kids inherited it. And then mm-hmm. there are a couple of grandkids that inherited those shares. You have 10 or 15 owners that don't get along. That's one. Mm-hmm. A break in the title chain a lot of times is caused by missing probate. Or let's say a person who buys a property and for some reason they forget to record the deed. And then they go sell it to somebody else. This happens on rural land. Mm-hmm. They don't go to title companies. Sometimes they don't even use lawyers. Or sometimes they do use lawyers. But they don't record that deed. They go to the next person, it trades a couple of times, and now you want to sell it to me and I want title insurance because the grandkid's done with this property. They have a break in the title chain from 40 years ago, and the person who sold it's dead. You got to fix that to be able to sell this. And most people aren't going to dig in and say, let's figure this out. Yeah. So those are the deals that we have practiced and have the experience and systematically execute. So walk me through, right? Clearing title on a property that 40 years ago, someone sold it, but didn't record the deed. How are you clearing that title? So here's how it's going to start. One of Steve's realtors calls Mm -hmm. him and says, would you like to list your property with me? And they say, great, I've been ready to do this. Come do a listing appointment. They come do their pitch. It's exciting. They get a listing agreement. They put it on MLS and they get a contract for Mm $250,000. And the title company takes the contract and returns some title work. And down there on the Schedule C, it says all these things. Mm -hmm. The biggest one is you have a break in the title chain. From 1974, there's no vesting deed for John Grubbs who sold it in 1983. Mm -hmm. There's a gap, 10-year gap or whatever. That's the issue. Well, now your seller, your agent seller, is unhappy. The realtor says, let's call a lawyer. The lawyer doesn't really know what to do, strangely enough. They don't, and they go through this process, and then they walk away. And then, then wholesalers or investors you know, call these people, and they take a stab at it. Mm-hmm. Same problem. Now they've tried to sell us property two or three times, and it comes on my radar because they finally say, I'm just done paying the taxes. I can't sell it. I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. Forget it. They stop paying the taxes, or they maybe get referred by one of the, the third agent that gets involved, mm-hmm. shows up to my plate. I look at this and say... <laughs> First off, is the juice worth the squeeze? Mm -hmm. Unless the property's worth 250 grand, I really don't want to touch it because there's not enough for me to want to do it. Yeah. I need to be able to pay legal bills to fix the problems, pay enough money to the seller where it's actually worth their time to show up and close, and then have enough equity where I want to make 50 or 100 grand on the deal. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I'm going to look at it and say, here's the break in the title chain. This person that died that should have given a deed in 1974. We're going to do some genealogy research and find out he's got three kids. They're all still alive. So our private investigator is going to track those three people down Mm -hmm. and tell them we have a title problem. Tell you what, we really need to get this solved. We'll give you five grand to sign a bunch of documents to clear up this break in the title chain. Mm -hmm. Will you help us? You're going to get an affidavit of airship from the deceased parent. 
and deeds from these three kids. Mm -hmm. If they agree, great. Give them the five grand, do the paperwork, record it all in the land records. And then when you go back and show the title title company, boom, you're clean. But every once in a while they say, we're not doing this. No way. And that's when I have to say, okay, I really wish you would help us. But instead of me giving that money to you, I'm going to have to give it to a lawyer and we're going to file a quiet title action. And the unfortunate part is we have to list y'all as defendants because y'all would be the only person that would have a claim against this property outside of us. I don't want to do that, but I got to fix this problem. Can I give the money to you instead of the lawyers? Mm-hmm. Most times they'll change their mind. Right. One in 10 times, they don't change their mind. We get to go to court and they don't show up and get a default judgment and title. And you win anyway. Right. And they don't get any money. Yeah. It's so really- in that case, that's how that works. <laughs> got it. So either way, we're finding the errors. We're playing nicely at first. And if they don't cooperate, then we're going through court. And either way, title is clean. Title's going to get fixed. When that judge's order is handed down, mm-hmm. that's what the title company will ensure on the back of. Mm-hmm. They trusted the judicial system worked. Have you ever had a situation where, because um, you got to clear title because there was some, like, money changed hand, deed, deed changed hands. Have you ever had a situation where, I don't know, you couldn't prove that the sale occurred. I guess if you sign a quick claim, it doesn't really matter. Well, when, when that transaction, so that's part of the job of a quiet title or a trespass to try title suit, mm-hmm. depending on the fact pattern. I'm in the middle of one right now. The family said they didn't sell the property. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, okay. So what you're telling me is someone showed up and lived on this property for 20 years, paid the taxes, here's the tax records, they maintained it. Then they sold somebody else. They moved on the property for 10 years. So you're telling me that your relative didn't sell the property. They just vacated, never to be seen again. Mm -hmm. They said, yeah. So I think you're going to have to convince a judge of this because I think this sounds like BS. What is it? um, What's it called when you stay on a property? Adverse possession. Adverse possession. So that's another layer. One of the tricky parts of the adverse possession thing is you need to have color of title, which would be some sort of instrument of title in Texas. Otherwise you're going to have to go through like a 10 year or 20 year statute and you can tack the prior owners claims together, but it's a little more complicated lawsuit. Yeah. People think it's going to fix a bunch of title problems and it's a very narrow window of what it will fix. Yeah. I've never been involved in an adverse possession. I mean, you learn about it, right? In real estate school. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think like, I think Louisiana is like one of those states where like, it's great, you know, but like here it's 10 years. Right. Oh, okay. So uh, I think Texas is like seven years or something like that. Well, we have multiple statutes. The shortest is four, okay. but the longest is 25. So it depends on the fact pattern. Did you occupy the property? Did you pay the taxes? Do you have color of title, which means a vesting instrument like a deed, even if it's a bad deed or an erroneous deed, mm-hmm. do you have that? Yeah. So it just depends on. Yeah, a lot of factors. Right. So there are three different deals you're working on right now, just to add clarity and context to what we're talking about today. So you got 13 acre tract of land worth 250K. You want to talk about that? Talk about that deal? You know, why I like talking about that one is, obviously, when we get, we're in this environment, we talk about the biggest, coolest, craziest deals. I picked it's that a, one. It's a podcast. We have to talk about right. this. <laughs> but I picked that one because it's a, it's a mean deal. It's a very average type. Mm-hmm. More often than not, I bet you that fits 50% of the transactions. It's worth about two hundred fifty grand. i am going to be all in for between fifty dollars and $70,000. And my sales cycle, well, cash conversion cycle, from the moment I call that person until the time I get paid selling it is about 120 days. Mm -hmm. And that could be any of those problems you're talking about, but it generally won't include a lawsuit. I could file a lawsuit and then the counterparties will settle real quickly. Mm -hmm. But if you actually have to litigate, it doesn't fall into this category, but that track the land, I've got half a dozen that fit that same category Mm -hmm. and they're quick. They came from the delinquent tax list. You make 150 or 180 grand on them and you turn it a hundred and 20 days mm-hmm. and your investment is 50 to 70 grand. It yeah. beats the hell out of flipping houses. And is this one of those where you, your guys are on it? They see the public record and they're, you said the first pig of the trough. Is that the expression you guys use in Texas? Yeah. <laughs> first pig of the trough. Yeah. yeah. So is this, is this an example of that? This is, but in these cases, we're not waiting for the tax foreclosure sale to be issued. We're going in and looking at the court docket mm-hmm. to see when the tax lawsuit is filed because it can take six months to two years for the judicial foreclosure to be complete and the sale order happen. Mm -hmm. We're doing it the moment this lawsuit is filed 
and citation has been issued to the property owner, the moment they know foreclosure is getting ready to happen, mm -hmm. we're looking at that date in the docket and we're now calling. Gotcha. So we're before the people calling before the tax sale, mm -hmm. but right after the sheriff leaves their house. Got it. So what are you guys looking at to pull that record? There's a public, a public uh, open, web, open source website mm -hmm. that it's the docket search. Mm -hmm. In our area, it's the district court that records all the tax lawsuits. Yeah. And we literally go in and type in Bear County, which their county, as a plaintiff. Mm -hmm. And the defendant is all these Whatever. people. Yeah. So generally, the counties don't sue people. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's generally tax lawsuits. Gotcha. And are you only in Texas? Yeah. Yeah. Because gotcha. I think um, you and Uncle Carl. Oh, right? Carl's in North Carolina. He's in South North Carolina. Carolina. Yeah. In, yeah, South Carolina. I think it's like, because uh, um, I think you guys do something similar where you guys love Dirty title. The messes. Yeah. Yeah, I like Carl. He's a great guy. Yeah. He's a wild character. Wild character. Uh, and you got another one, a 99 acre tract of land in Austin. So what, what's the story with that one? Most business owners waste their time and money on solutions that never fix the root problems. They'll address all the symptoms due to slow revenue, and because they're only fixing the consequences, the real problem stays hidden and the cycle of wasting time and money continues. It's like having a lingering headache that won't go away despite trying every over-the-counter medicine, when in reality, you should have just gone to the doctor and had them figure out exactly what was causing the headache. And that's what's so difficult about business. You can see and feel the symptoms and yet struggle to find it. Now imagine you can find the prescription that doesn't just mask the symptoms, but actually addresses the root cause. Where would your business be if you address that right now? That's what our sales event is about. Your marketing doesn't suck, your leads aren't bad, and your operations aren't terrible. It's that you haven't addressed what actually makes you money in wholesale, which is the conversations you have with homeowners. It's critical that you build trust with sellers, demonstrate that you fully understand their situation, know exactly what's keeping them up at night, and paint the ideal outcome that leads them to a better future by working with you. That's what it takes to get signed contracts and keep your business going. Simply put, at our event, you'll walk away with the framework, phrases, questions, documents, and process to close more sales and buy more houses. Join the hundreds of others who have come to our live event and dramatically grown their business. Our event is happening soon and is available for you to join only if you're willing to take the pill. This one is a combination of a, a, a moderate level of distress on the acquisition side wholesaling played a factor in it. And then our just general ability to do research and think critically and take action is another part of it. Mm -hmm. These folks um, had been under contract with a big developer for two years. They were collecting hard earnest money payments. And when interest rates shot up, this was their inheritance. They were planning on making $4 million on this thing. And the big builder cut the contract and walked away when interest rates shot up last year. So they were building a property. Well, they weren't building yet. Okay. The developer was a large national home builder, and they'd been under contract doing the entitlements. Mm -hmm. There were four phases to this development. This was the fourth phase. The fourth, the last phases are the most expensive because they develop in. Mm -hmm. They have to carry that when it's the very last set of houses to build and sell. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the national builders cut the last few phases when interest rates shot up last year because they didn't know what was happening. Mm -hmm. And these people's contract got cut. Interest rates shot through the roof. Now they're like, oh, great. Do we have to lower the price? When are we going to get our money? It took two years for them. They didn't close. When are we getting next? They were moving. They were getting ready to retire. Like it was a tough spot for them. One of my guys called them literally the month after this contract fell apart. And they said, we'll give it to you for the same price we contracted the national builder two years ago, which was four and a half million bucks. More than I was able to pay for in cash at that moment. Mm -hmm. And then. I had someone that was going to buy it for me for six. So we we're going to wholesale this thing, six and a half. We we're going to make $2 million on a wholesale. Mm -hmm. The buyer out of Houston calls me the day before he's going to send me the contract. We'd already orally agreed and reduces his price by a million dollars. And I just hang up. He calls right back. We got disconnected. No, we didn't. Click. That's it. I want to say some choice words right now, but <laughs> I didn't. Anyway, he says, I'm coming tomorrow to San Antonio. I'm going to talk. We're going to get this figured out. And I was like, no, we're not. Save your time. Mm -hmm. During that process, I thought, okay, if he shows up, we still need to talk through this. And it was clearly a development play. That's what I was starting to learn because a builder had it 
before me. Mm -hmm. So we called a local developer and he worked for one of the big national firms and asked him to help us understand this and pitch it to these guys so we could get our price restored mm -hmm. and give these buyers the confidence in it. While we were talking to this guy, we realized he worked for the national home builder that was in contract with us that beforehand. Yeah. And he just left the company to go develop on his own. <laughs> Perfect. So when this happens, I say, hold on a minute. Tell me what this is worth. He said, we could sell it to any of the top five large home builders in this area for $20 million. I'm like, whoa, 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 what am I missing here? And he said, you need to buy the 26 acres next to us. That'll make your 75 acres and the 26, 74 and 26, 100. Mm -hmm. So you need to spend another 2 million. So now it's not four, it's six. Mm -hmm. And it's going to cost you a million to complete the entitlements with engineering and legal. But once you do that, you can sell the land with the development agreement for $20 million to these builders. And then you also can create a mud, which in Texas, it's a utility district. We can collect some yeah. revenue, and that mud will be worth $8 million. So I call this guy back from Houston and said, don't call me anymore. We got this figured out. Yeah. I go back to my, the two partners there in the office, and I'm like, we got to pay for this, man. They're like, what are you talking about? This is more than we spent on anyone deal ever. <laughs> Called a couple of buddies of mine and said, y'all want to come in as equity partners? We're closing on this thing in like 60 days at this mm -hmm. point. And the guys were like, yep, I love you. I know you. I trust you. It's the first time you ever raised money. I'm glad you called me first. We're in. Yeah. Do you want me to finish telling you about the rest of the deal? No, we'll send the money. <laughs> so we closed on it. Um, planning and zoning has approved it. We get city council approval in the next two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. And we're ready to start marketing and drawing a pre preliminary plat. Yeah. So probably by the end of this year, we s end of this year, early next year, we sell it. Yeah. In a pretty good spot. Man, it, so this, these are the opportunities that you've got when a market falls apart mm -hmm. and you've got some available cash and access to resources. Survive. Yeah, and you're also willing to step back and say, hold on, this is a wholesale deal. Let's do some research. Should it be a wholesale deal? Should we buy mm -hmm. it? Really methodical, but I mean, these are like career changing. This is a career changing deal for us. Absolutely. You can look at it. What's the best play? Yeah, and there are folks out there that would listen to this right now and say, this sounds so complicated. I don't even know that I could do that. It sounds like it's over my head. Where do I start? You know what I did when I was in that same exact spot six months ago? I said, who do I know that knows this stuff? And I started calling them. So there are people out there that might find themselves in a the spot. Call me. Or maybe don't call me. Call someone like me. Yeah. Your resources are how something like this is going to turn your couple million dollars into a life-changing event. Yeah. That's amazing. So what was the story with the Houston guy that <laughs> wanted to do the price drop? Man, that dude has been calling us. They're a younger group putting together a bunch of um, investment money from India. They're from India, and they had a lot of relatives over here in businesses, and they were pooling their money to mm -hmm. do deals and getting some management fees. And the guy realized he had a good deal in front of him, but he wasn't quite sure how good it was. Mm -hmm. And he was literally picking at us over pennies, relatively speaking. A million dollars isn't pennies, but in the scope of this thing, mm -hmm. it's, it's immaterial. So, like, do you think he knew what he had and he got cute? No, I think he had a pretty good idea and he was close, mm -hmm. but I, around that time I'd introduced him to the developer because I was going to use, have him help us explain it to him. Mm -hmm. And once he understood the numbers, he came back and told us he'd give us the full amount. And at this point I'm like sick of his calls. Mm -hmm. Then he starts offering over what his original <laughs> offer was. And finally I was just up front. I said, dude, I realize this is a possibly a $30 million deal. And you're trying to save yourself a million dollars. I'm thankful you didn't, but we're literally closing in a couple, like a month. Yeah. I'm buying this and I'm not going to walk away from it. And then of course he's like, okay, well, if you'd like some equity and all this other stuff, I'm like, man, I'm busy. <laughs> um, and then, uh, the third one. So, um, 8,000 square foot warehouse. What's the story with that one? That one came from, God, this sounds funny. You're going to recognize this tired landlord, mm -hmm. literally a tired landlord. One of my favorite asset classes is metal buildings, warehouses, things like that. They're very simple. If you look at the office you're in now, you've got carpet, you've got drywall, you've got drop ceilings, you've got all kinds of electrical lights, you've got air conditioners. In a metal building, you don't have that. Mm -hmm. You've got red iron that you can see. You've got metal R panel, which is just that sheeting, that metal sheeting on the outside, which you can see. You have a concrete floor, which you can see. Uh, and you'll have electrical, which you can see. I literally inspect these buildings in 10 minutes myself. I walk You're around. You're talking about shells. Yeah, metal warehouse, just a metal building. Mm -hmm. But the utility for those is so high. People will use them for landscape companies, um, automotive shops. 
the list goes on. Window tent shops. They'll put daycares in them and finish them out. It's really wild. Mm -hmm. But that shell has a lot of utility. And you'd be surprised how many end users there are for it. So I turned, I've stumbled onto one of them several years ago, and that was a deal changer, which really got me in a commercial. Mm -hmm. And this particular one, hired landlord, we called him at the right time. He had a deadbeat tenant who needed to get out. So, this so it is, was occupied. Right, half. Half, okay. I mean, the guy's paying like $600 a month. Market rate is $10,000 a month on this thing. And this guy's paying six or $800. This is what you'll see in commercial, the distress, when you have a tenant in a lease that you can't get him out of. Mm -hmm. You got a landlord who's tired. He's paying his taxes, but not the month they're due. Like the next month, it's just things are slowly getting out of hand. Yeah. And our, we it's, actually— It's bursting at the seams. Yeah. It just quite hadn't busted yet. It spilled mm -hmm. over. We asked him how much he wanted. He said six fifty. I said, okay. And the gold on this is he's owned it for 10 years. He paid three seventy five dollars or 400 mm -hmm. He's making money selling it to me. Mm -hmm. And the extra gold, the, like the sprinkles on top of the gold, is once you get a tenant in there on the income model, it's worth about 1.2 to 1.5. Right. So he's making money. He's happy. Mm -hmm. I'm making money. I'm happy. Yeah. This sounds a lot different than these single family distress deals where you're like duking it out to the closing table, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Yeah. It's very different. Yeah. Uh, particularly with the um, entire landlord in. It's a. Win win where they feel like they're winning. It makes me happy. Yeah. Uh, how did you come across that deal again? <laughs> These are cold calls. Cold calls. Yeah. Just so a lot of times we're pulling a list that's looking specifically for distress. Mm -hmm. In this case, we look for an asset class. So that la that that list was metal building slash warehouse under twenty thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. We filtered it. Yeah. And we're just calling. And we're just listening to folks. You know, you'll hear one in 100 calls has some level of pressure, and we want that. Mm -hmm. Maybe one in 20 has an interest in selling, and maybe one in 50 has an interest in selling, and they're in the ballpark on the price. Right. So you kind of work through that. But we did recognize the early signs of distress, and I mm -hmm. believe that's why he wasn't going to be aggressive and try to price it really high and wait for a long time. He's like, let me get out. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was wise in that regard, and we were happy. Um, if he didn't work with you, was it one where he had a matter of months if we had to do something? I don't think he was there. He was paying his taxes just a little late, but he was figuring out how to pay them. Got it. I think his biggest issue is um, his tenant had a longer lease, and his tenant was just sitting in there paying this crummy rent rate very late. This guy was a nice guy. And in this case, I always, always say I'm fair but firm. Mm -hmm. This dude's got a smoking rent rate. He should be paying rent in advance before he loses his location to do business. Mm -hmm. So I send him a demand letter that says, you're in breach, get out. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back and says, we'll pay on time. And I'm not going to take, I'm not going to relent on that default. Once you've accelerated a lease, mm -hmm. if you give them an opportunity to catch up and stay, they can do it. Right. Once I've gotten a chance to accelerate them, you're done, you're out. Yeah. So once I got that opportunity, he was like just a couple days beyond where I could accelerate, done. Mm -hmm. Got him out. Uh, using legal definitions here for everyone, so accelerate. Yeah, so accelerate is once you're beyond the passive remediation, you, the lender will no longer accept any more payments, no more reinstatements. Mm -hmm. You're accelerated, and it's basically paid in full, get out or get yeah, out. Exactly. Uh, so with commercial leases with acceleration, do they pay the whole deal, like the entire balance? So there's a couple ways to do it. You get in a spot where if you demand, you can sue for the balance. Like they might have four years left on it, and you can sue for mm -hmm. that. The problem is you have to let them stay. In this case, I want to terminate them, and they don't owe me anything beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's only like what they're delinquent on now. Right. So you don't really, you're not really going to make any money on that situation, but you're making money on the property. Yeah, you're getting so them out so you can increase the rent, so you can increase the value. Bingo. Uh, so yeah, that deal right there is going to rent. Well, actually, I have a tenant now. It's one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, and I've spent six fifty. I spent another hundred grand on tenant improvements and broker fees. Mm -hmm. Seven hundred. 50,000, I think, is where I'm at. And then you got 120,000 in rent. Dude, you're talking 15 to 20% returns. Yeah. Works out pretty good. So, with your deals, are you working with um, equity partners? You're getting private money, you're getting. No, on these deals, these are all in house. You know, mm -hmm. the, benef the benefit of having other financially responsible folks is, you know, we're taking a salary of one or $200,000 a year and living on it. Mm -hmm. The remaining amount of money that is earned and these businesses stays in to grow. 
to buy more assets. Now we're going to hit a, we'll hit a critical mass fairly soon where you have more excess cash than your needs are for the next deal. So you'll start making larger draws to the partners. Mm -hmm. But the big deal I told you about, that's the 237 house uh, development track. Mm -hmm. That one I took on some uh, friends as equity partners. Outside of that, it's been only operating partners money. Gotcha. Sometimes we use bank money. Mm -hmm. Um, and then it's just something to touch on. Uh, you mentioned a moment ago entitlements and that's something that, uh, we've talked about a few times on the show, but specifically last week we had, uh, uh Anthony Gaona and, and Daniel Martinez. Oh yeah. Right. And they're doing the same thing, right? They're looking at like, should I entitle this? Should I not entitle this? So entitlement is just one of those, uh, sexy things that if you're in land, you can kind of see these opportunities, but if you're not in land. You know what it is. What is that big word? Right. So entitlements, it's a funny thing because uh, there are a lot of people doing really, really well with entitlements, but not a lot of people talking about it, right? Which I think we're going to talk about later on about how they can learn more about this. Um, yeah, the markup is huge. Yeah. In summary, what an entitlement is, is it says this is what you can do with the land. But if you have undeveloped, unzoned, unimproved land that's near or in a municipality, the municipality won't let you just slam 200 houses on it. Mm -hmm. You've got to get an agreement with them to extend utilities. They're going to agree to overlay a new zoning on it and you want it to match with your density of housing. Mm -hmm. It's what you get is a big document. There's a couple hundred pages called development agreement, a DA. And it's a negotiation between you and them. We'll allow you to get this. We'll give this. We're having to give like two acres in the back part of ours, give it to the city so they can put a water uh, tower back there because mm -hmm. they need a water tower. It's high elevation on that road. They got nowhere else and no one else will sell them land. So that's basically a bartering chip. We need this water tower and they're just looking at you. You're like, I guess you get a water tower. You're going to sign <laughs> my deal. Right. That's what the entitlement process is. Yeah. And it's interesting because like why entitle? And why would someone buy entitled land when they can just buy the land, right? So um, from your perspective, we were saying the market's pretty good for entitlements. I know exactly why. So Wall Street has told the big builders by how they support their share price, your builders like Lennar, Meritage, these guys, mm -hmm. Wall Street has told them your builders, that is it. You're doing nothing more. You're not carrying assets long-term with a very small exception. Mm -hmm. And if you do, you have to have a certain internal rate of return to match what we expect from you. If it doesn't match that, you do not do it. Mm -hmm. And that's created an industry over here for folks like me to buy land, entitle it, and then sell it to one of these builders. So they literally go out there, start filing permits in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. And they don't have to carry it on their books for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. So like I get to come in as a developer, right? I was going to pretend, you know, this other industry. Um, I only develop. I only do what I'm good at. That's right. Let these other guys get it all the way to a point of where I can put a shovel in the ground. And you get paid really well to get to a point where you can put a shovel in the ground. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of risk. It's really hard to use debt on deals like this unless you're a very credit worthy person. And even if you are, you realize you're going to have to deal with some debt service. Mm -hmm. So there's risk. I mean, how many people can rip a check for six and a half million to buy land? Not many. So the risk goes up. Mm -hmm. And if we get this wrong, and can't get the development agreement approved, well, now you're valuing that not on 237 pad sites. You're now valuing it as basically rural land. Yeah. So I paid, what does that come out to be? 60000 an acre, more or less? Dude, that ain't cheap land, man. It's not. And that's kind of what we were talking about last week is uh, there's another investor uh, I'm familiar with, and basically he buys these uh, uh, land on, uh, with a due diligence. Mm. And the due diligence is like, if I can't get this entitled, you get the land back. That's how most, so, okay, so he's, if he's closing on it that way, that's unique. Most times what will happen is guys will contract for 12 months mm -hmm. or sometimes 24 months, and you have to make hard earnest money payments. Mm -hmm. So I'm buying extensions, mm -hmm. and I don't get refunded that. No, that's, that's spent. That's, yeah, that's, that's your ticket to the dance. Right. Hopefully you're a good dancer, but that's your ticket. You got to pay to go in. You got to pay to go in. But and there may not, be someone to dance with you. But you're not on the hook. For the entire piece of land, if it doesn't work. A lot of deals like this, you can spend two to three hundred grand right. in expenses and in, in earnest money and engineering and whatnot. Yeah. And if you can't get the deal approved or you can't get someone to buy it, you walk and you burn a couple hundred grand. Right. But in that case, you had a shot at five million bucks. Exactly. And all it takes is a couple deals like that to say, I'm now willing to commit several million, five hundred grand, five hundred grand, five hundred grand, because I just made ten. Mm -hmm. I'll dump 
three million in new projects and still have six or seven left. Mm -hmm. If some of those don't work, that's okay. You have some shrink budget and it really works. Right. That's a fast. That's if you model. don't go buy the new house in the Lambo. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting model. Um, and then one thing I really like that you said a moment ago was that a lot of people listening are a lot closer to doing what you're doing, but don't realize it. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Do you want to expand upon that? Yeah, Steve. It sounds scary. You know, the words we're using are big words. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a really complicated process, but there's only one competency that I've learned every detail about, and that's the curative title work. That's, that's my core competency. Mm -hmm. All this other stuff, I've got experts. I've got a partner. I bring somebody on. I pay a consultant. Half of this stuff I don't know anything about. Right. But if I can find the right dude and give him some money or give him some equity, they tell me this works and this is how. Mm -hmm. So I encourage folks to be more resourceful than bright. You don't have to go learn it all. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to law school. I didn't learn all this stuff that way. Mm -hmm. I learned picking up in the field, hiring great people. Yeah. So that's why I encourage folks, when you're in a deal that looks something like this, start looking at your resources. 50% of my problems are solved in my phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, Dr. Ben Hardy wrote the book, right? Who, not how. It's that. Oh, bingo. Yeah. Right? Everyone's always trying to figure out, well, how can I do this? Like, you Dude, don't have to be the one that figures it out. If I could find a, a video on my phone of my screen, I have a sticky note on the bottom of my screen that says, who, comma, not how. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. and it was one of the best lessons I, I, I took uh, when I took strategic coach many, many years ago. So um, you're doing an event in Dallas. Yes. Talk to me about that. April 6th, which is a Saturday, coming up in maybe it's six weeks, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's a distressed property acquisition workshop. It's going to be eight hours. Me, a lot of guys I work with, several other experts. I've got some attorneys, some surveyors. going to have an incredible group of folks. We're going to spend eight hours going through this entire business model, how to understand it, what the deals look like, how to find them, how to negotiate them, what are the kind of trades you want, how to do them as JVs with us, or find your own partners to do them. Um, it's an incredible day. You get to meet awesome people in the industry, and I'm 100% certain there is not another group of people like this, of this size, that will meet together anywhere in the United States. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So for the price of a pair of Air Jordans, you basically get to learn this entire thing top and bottom. And if you don't figure out how to do it on your own, you know how to look at a deal and refer it to someone for a really big fee. Yeah. To me, that's 50% of the people. The other 50% really want to learn the details. Mm -hmm. But I think it's huge. If you're in single family, if you're in rural land, and you have had deals that couldn't close, then you need to come. Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to um, who, not how. Um, and uh, I got a friend, Chris Rude, you know, he's always talking about like, there's nothing wrong with buying friends, right? Pay to be in the room, to be surrounded by other people doing the things you want to do. There's no shame in that. Like there's this ego thing where we kind of stop like, oh, I don't want to pay that, right? Yeah. But to be in the room with other people doing it, right? What, even if it's not you, I, I've, held, I've held a lot of events over the years. The very first event, those people are still collaborating. They're still doing deals together. I think uh, you're in San Antonio, so JR. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He came to our first event. Oh, right? wow. Like These people are still doing deals together. So, like, I couldn't, uh, I can't stress enough, right? And you're going to get into everything about your business. So, can you elaborate on me so you can, you can share everything? What does that mean you're going to share? everything. When you started your real estate business, it was with the dream to change the world and make an impact. The reality is you might not be near that. If you're like many investors, you might be frustrated. You just can't succeed in getting your salespeople to do what they know that they should do. They operate on their own terms, meaning they don't follow your process that you know produces consistent results. So each month feels like a roller coaster because revenue is coming in inconsistently. How relieving would it be if your salespeople did follow your proven process, were receptive to feedback and training, and could be held accountable to the results that leads to their success 
and your success? Would your company stop riding in the roller coaster of revenue, frustration, and mental drain? And that's why we brought in Ren Bartlett. He's built a business that's wholesaled 100 plus houses a month. The people he brings into his business are bought into the process. They have a deep understanding of their role and are excited to be held accountable because as a business owner, he truly knows their deeper why so that we can demonstrate that our company is here to provide for their true purpose. If you'd like to finally stop dreading managing people who don't follow a process, produce inconsistent results, and aren't bought into your company, sign up for our sales leadership program to end the emotional stress of inconsistent results and finally have a fulfilling business working with people you want to be around. So I'm a very transparent person. There's nothing that I withhold. A lot of folks do events and you get there and they tell you some fun stuff. They hype you up and they try to sell you on the three-day package and then the coaching. That ain't this. Yeah. I explain what the different lead types look like, how I find them. I'm going to have my laptop up. This is going to be a working session. Mm. I'm going to have other experts there. So we're going to talk about every single detail, what they look like, how to find them. I'm going to go through docket searching like live with my computer there. Mm. And I'll bring my chair down and sit in the middle of everybody. So we're looking at this massive screen together, figuring out what these look like, figuring out how to pay for them, mm -hmm. how we negotiate them. I've got recorded calls that are live from, it'd be like a sales training. Yeah. I mean, we have 45 minutes worth of calls that we're going to be listening to together and talking about as a group. Mm -hmm. Like it's a workshop of any workshop. Yeah. But I think a person can walk away from this with a complete thorough understanding mm -hmm. of, you know, what we're talking about now is very conceptual. And people are excited because they're like, dude, you make tons of money and mm -hmm. it's so smart. No one else does it. And that's great. But when you say how, we can talk about this a little bit. You got me for eight hours talking at this speed, dude, you get it all. Yeah. And there's no question I will not ask when it comes to what you make, how you spend it, the, the real problems you had. When you get into the litigation and I mean, I've got two dozen lawsuits going almost at any time right now. It takes a lot to make me nervous. Every once in a while it happens. I'll explain any of those questions. I won't <laughs> hide it. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, are you coaching people as well? You know, yeah, the last couple of years I've started doing like small kind of boutique type mm -hmm. coaching five to eight people groups. It's usually a session a year. Yeah. You know, we'll spend 12 to 16 weeks going through the educational part and then everybody's on the phones and I'll spend the rest of the year doing deal reviews by zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm wrapping up, um, a session right now and, you know, I, one of the guys is working on a deal. It's we're going to sell for 600 grand should be ready to sell next week. We're in this one all in for 70 <laughs> coaching student. And I'm JVing with him. Cause he's like, he's been in here and he's afraid to spend the 70. I said, dude, I'll be happy to JV with you. He goes, are you sure? I'm, like, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to spend 70 grand. You're going to make 250. I'm going to make 250. Yeah. It's a smoking deal. There's another one we just picked up from another guy that, that deal is 150, and he's bought his first 25% share for $500. Mm -hmm. There's 20,000 owed in taxes. I, if he doesn't net six figures on this deal, I'm going to be like astounded. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of deals we do together, and a lot of the folks elect to be a JV partner with me. Yeah. So I, I'll do it with them because that way I prove to you I feel really good about this level of risk. Yeah. Well, and you're a capital partner. Right, yeah. That's hard to find these days when you find a technician who, and it's me. It's mm -hmm. not someone in my office, so it is me. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to be a technician and a capital partner. That's hard. Well, especially because you're willing to poke holes in the deal. You can say, like, this is why it's not a good deal, or here's where this is risky, right? Whereas someone that's not a technician who hasn't done it. Yeah. Can't. I will put my money where my mouth is. I just won't poop on your deals. Mm -hmm. If it's good, I'm going in. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Uh, so what is your biggest struggle today? You know, right now I'm at a really happy place because we had a lot of work to do last year, man. Mm -hmm. We were working twice as hard for half the money. You know, when things are good and you're just raking in money and everybody's happy and your problems don't seem that big, it's, it's a fun place to be, although you have issues. But when things slow down, all your little problems, well, they're not little problems. They're big. They just look little because you had all this revenue. Mm -hmm. It was kind of covering them all up. Right. Those little problems, they, they show what their real size is. And last year was tough, man. Mm -hmm. we, had a, we had to work together, a lot of our partners, on a lot of things that we didn't expect to happen. There's a lot of deal level stuff. There was financing level stuff. And I say this apprehensively. I think we're pulling out of that mm -hmm. to a point where the monthly cash flow meetings aren't happening. Or the, we were doing weekly cash flow meetings for a little while. Mm -hmm. That has not been our business ever. Yeah. That was happening. 
and we're engaging in great deals. But man, we're watching the cash close. We had to. That's done. We've mm-hmm. now canceled our weekly cash flow meetings. They're now monthly cash flow meetings. Yeah. Everybody's starting to feel more satisfied. Like it, we're in a good spot. I'm not going to say that we don't have problems, but I'd have to think about it for a while to really tell you on the matter right now. So yeah. Well, I'm happy. I'll- I'm looking forward to those days because we're still looking at the finances every week, right? We're still reviewing the balance brutal. sheets. We're still looking at the PNL, right? We're still like looking at like, all right, well, how much money came in, how much money went out. So we can project what we're our going. runway is if nothing else comes See, in. In your retail brokerage business right now, your industry is under fire. Yeah. So I'm over here buying like problem properties for 20 cents on the dollar. That's not under fire and it will never be under fire. Yeah. So once we got out of that really strange spot, at that point, I say, dude, we're great. Let's go. Mm-hmm. But I think your industry is going to have a little bit more time. Well, we'll see. We'll see what happens right, with, uh, with the uh, single family homes and so on. Um, but yeah, like I'm looking forward to having it being monthly versus weekly. <laughs> um, what was the biggest lesson you learned last year? So you learned a lot of leadership lessons. What was the biggest lesson you learned last year? You know, I did this on the front end as I was recruiting people. And as things got going, everybody's, for lack of a better term, fat and happy. Things are going great. And when things get tough again, you have to sit down and talk to people. You have to get connected again. And we almost got disconnected in a way because we were all just running our section of the business. And I spent a lot of time with people again talking about all the details. What's bothering you personally? What's the problem you're having? Oh, that sales manager? Oh, that salesperson? Oh, not that salesperson? half of your sales team. So kind of just connecting closer Mm -hmm. with the operating partners again. That was, that was a big one. That was a really big one. Yeah. And I think we all had to, right? The ones that made it had to really, they had to really buckle down and work um, close knit together. Yeah. Roll your sleeves up, get back to work. Yeah. Um, So, what are some last thoughts you'd like to leave all the listeners with? You know, I'd like to encourage people to understand that you're capable of far more than you believe you really are. Um, I have a close friend out here in Phoenix, and just several years ago, he just told me that I wasn't thinking big enough. And it sounds cliche, and you hear it all the time, but I was really inspired by some of the stuff he was doing. Mm-hmm. And I went back home and said, we're not going to do X, we're going to do 2X. And I'll be damned. It didn't take long for that to happen. You've got to invest more resources. You have to be a little bit more aggressive and you really have to push. But you're, 1X is no different than 2X. It's really not. And once you start to understand that concept, you realize it's easier than I expected it was. Mm-hmm. You're capable of a lot more than you think you are. When you look at deals like this, if I were to look back 10 years ago and you were to tell me that I was buying $2 million apartment complexes through litigation for a million dollars, and all, you know, things like this, I wouldn't have believed it. Mm-hmm. But it just happened a step at a time along the way. And one by one, it got there. And I'm no brighter or harder working than probably half the people that are watching today. Mm-hmm. But the message is to get out there, put in the work, ask the questions, build a lot of relationships. And you'll be surprised, man. You're going to be in that big old house with all those fancy cars, and all this money sitting around. You can turn your life around in five years. Yeah. So get out there and do it. Absolutely. So we're going to post a link to your workshop um, in the show notes. How can someone get a hold of you if they want to connect with you? Great place is Instagram. If it's not me, it's someone in my office catching that really quickly. So Logan Fulmer, uh, find me on Instagram, send us a message. Mm-hmm. The other way is office at arpusa.com. Somebody in my office catches that quickly. Mm-hmm. So you'll get to me or someone quick. Yeah. So it's not Logan Bentley Fulmer, it's just Logan Fulmer. Right. We dropped the Bentley. Right, right. Yeah, I did that actually. You know, for Instagram, I had a, a moniker and some branding. And finally, I said, man, it's Logan. Come find me. Logan yeah. Fulmer. All right, well, I mean, real quick, we talked about this before the show. So why don't you share with everyone why? Because that might be important for them to understand your journey. You know, I've seen this with other folks. I've seen brands change. And our first brand name was Easy House Buyer, San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And it was like the best thing. Like, this is where we're headed. Like, this is who we are. And I look back now and I laugh at it. I'm like, dude, that sounds like so elementary. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's how the evolution happens. But I did notice every six to 12 months, our business has taken a slight turn and it's, it's veering a different way because it's growing and getting smarter. And I started to kind of back away from some of this. 
specific branding. Oh, we do have a brand, Asset Resolution Partners. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got that. You need something on your building. You need something on your business card. Um, but at the end of the day, folks know Logan Fulmer's the guy there. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to drop some of that stuff and just say, hey, it's me. Yeah. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure, Steve. Definitely. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you guys next Shout time. Out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We real estate disruptors.